Okay, so today we're going to do muscle sense. And by, by muscle sense, I'm going to talk about all the things underneath your skin that allow you to be able to tell where your arm is. So I just want all of you to try this. Close your eyes and try to touch your nose. Now, it's, you might think that's not remarkable, but we'll see at the end of the class that it is amazing that you could actually do this. Uh, and it's due to all the sensory organs that you have underneath your skin. And they're involved in something called proprioception, which is your sense of limb position, where your, all your limbs are, and something called kinesthesia, which is the sense of the, their movement, how fast they're moving and in what direction. Now, in the previous chapter, we talked about all the receptors on the skin itself, and they're used to recognize the shape of objects, um, sort of something like the retina helping us see, but in this case, feel by the sense of touch. Now, today we're going to talk about all the stuff, as I just said, that are underneath the skin, in the muscles, in the joints, and they allow us to determine the shape of our own body. So again, we have this dichotomy between the shape of objects and the posi positions and uh, shape of our own bodies. So the joints involved here, there, there's one thing called muscle spindles, and they're located, sensors that are located within the muscles themselves. Then we have at the ends of the muscles, with, you have a tendon that attaches to the bone, and within that tendon, You've got something called Golgi tendon organs. Um, in the joints themselves, in the, 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 between the, the bones, you have things called joint afferents. And they're useful for extremes in position, so, so that you don't break your arms. Um, and then over here, especially when we, when we talk about the hand, it's the tactile receptors. We talked about how those tactile receptors can tell whether our fingers are, are bent or straightened out, whether the skin on top of them is being stretched or compressed. And that's a signal as well for giving you the shape of your own body. Now, there's also um, our old friend Corolla Discharge that is the, your internal sense of effort. Um, if you uh, um, direct the movement, you expect the arm to move, and you expect it to be in a certain position. So different receptors are better for different things. So we mentioned a bunch of them. We mentioned spindles. They're very good for get, getting your position and your velocity, how fast the, 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 the muscle shortening. The, go, the things in the Golgi tendons, the tendons um, are good at measuring how much force your muscles are exerting. And all of these receptors uh, sense a position in, in some ways, but other, more, some receptors are more accurate than others, and the brain learns to rely on the most accurate source of information. Um, so, for example, in the hands, um, the tactile receptors are quite important and less so important in the shoulder. Now, if, uh, if one receptor is lost, the brain shifts over to rely more on other receptors. So when you develop, when you get an artificial joint, of course, those, those afferents in your joint receptors are lost, um, and you, again, use other things to um, get, improve your sense of position. Um, if, uh, if, if you put a cuff on your arm, um, you'll find that, you, that the skin on your hand goes numb. Okay? And that's because, um, and, and while, so those receptors that tell, tell you what, whether the skin is compressed or stretched are lost, but you can still sense position quite well because 
uh, the muscles that pull all your fingers are actually pulled by tendons that are located in this upper arm region. So the muscles themselves are in the upper arm regions and they allow you, pulled by tendons, your, your fingers to close and open. And finally, um, that you've got your collar discharge. Um, there's a, an article that talks about a patient that uh, because of a neurological problem lost all sense uh, from his arms and legs. Um, and But he could still drive his car which was um, had a sort of uh, standard transmission so he could still tell when he shif shifted into first gear, second gear, third gear. Then he got himself a new car with a different transmission so that he had to push different amount to get to the same gears and he found he couldn't drive it because it the the the, um, the force he exerted exerted was different from what he was used to and uh, he, he had to sell his new car and buy back his old car and keep keep it running now the muscle spindles those are those yellow things you see here and they're located in the muscles, the, the orange or browner things around it. And you can see here that whatever happens to the muscle also happens to the spindle. So they're really ideal for measuring how long the muscle is. In contrast, uh, the, the, the Golgi tendon organs they're located in the tendons themselves and when a muscle contracts it pulls on the tendon and activates these organs and that allows that organ to be very accurate a measure of how much force is being exerted by that muscle. Now within the spindle you've got these um, fibers that, that and, and I've drawn two here but there's actually many located within the, each spindle and there are different shapes that one has this bulge here and it's called a bag and the other doesn't have this bulge and it's called a chain now around the bag like a coil you have an afret and um, when, when that that this bag region gets stretched by the muscle stretching it, uh, it opens up channels and produces action potentials down here. And similarly, the same thing happens in the chain fiber. There's, there's a coil around here. You'll notice that these two are thick and they signal, they, they go down a fiber that's labeled 1A. Off of the chain fiber, you have one that's thinner, and it goes down um, an afferent that's labeled number two. And these afferents, their size um, is indicated by the number that uh, is there. You know, so one A is the largest of all your fibers, and two is one of the smaller ones we'll consider today. And so it's slower conducting information to the cortex. Now, the one around the bag fiber is interesting because that's the reason for this bag. It, it, it acts much like your persinian afferent. Remember your persinian afferent, things got deformed, but then while, when it, after the stretch was complete, it sort of deformed back to its normal positions. Well, the same sort of event happens in these things. So when the stretch occurs, the firing occurs because deformation takes place. But then quickly, if the stretch maintains the same position, then the, 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 no, then no longer are action potentials generated. So this thing is very good at signaling how fast the muscle is being stretched, the velocity or speed at which this happens. In contrast, the things wrapped around the chain 
um, ha give a constant measure of how much the stretch is. And that is how much the, the length of the muscle is. So they're a good thing at measuring um, one's position. Now, so when the muscle undergoes a passive stretch, that is a stretch that maybe somebody else exerts on the muscle, um, you see that these guys lengthen, as you'd expect. And some interesting things happen. Uh, I've indicated the, the, the activity coming from the chain is, is indicated by these red action potentials or orange action potentials. And you can see that when you get stretched, the, the, the number of action potentials per second increases. And when you get shortened, they decrease. But there's still continuous flow of action potentials throughout. The ones coming from the bag are indicated in green. And you can see that the only time that those green action potentials appear is when a stretch occurs, like now. Okay? And then for the rest of the time, it's silent. So it just tells you when the length is increasing and at what rate is increasing. If the rate, if the muscle was being pulled quickly, that rate would go up. Now, in contrast, these things are not changing much in activity because this is a passive stretch and not much force is being exerted. Okay? The muscle isn't being contracted. Somebody else is lengthening. Something else is lengthening that muscle. Now, in contrast, when you do an active contraction, that is, you're you contract the muscle fibers within this muscle. The muscle itself shortens, and so the activity here decreases. Okay, If it is an extreme shortening, then the activity, even in those tonically active fibers, will become zero. In contrast, the activity during the contraction increases in these Golgi tendon organs. Now, to complicate things a little further, we have the brain can control the sensitivity of the spindles. Okay, uh, So a signal can come down to this, these, the bags or the chains and ca cause the ends of them, the poles, to contract. So activity is coming down. You can see these poles are contracting. That, in turn, stretches this middle portion. Same thing happens here. The poles are contracting. This middle portion is stretching. When the, the one coming to the chain fiber is called a static because it's sort of these things are a continuous flow of, of action potentials, whereas the one coming to the uh, bag fiber is called dynamic because just has a sort of a fa this phasic um, um, temporary um, activity. And um, you can see when, when, when this, this gets pulled, you become more position sensitive. When this gets pulled, you get more velocity or speed sensitive. Your sensitivity to changes in speed go up. So let's compare what happens when you have no gamma activity. This is the activity again coming from the green is the one from the bag. The, the orange is the one from the chain. And you can see that when it gets stretched, more orange comes down. And during the stretch, uh, you got a phasic or um, sudden increase in firing, but only during the stretch. Now, if we instead have gamma static, gamma static 
makes this fiber more sensitive. So you're now becoming more sensitive to changes in position. Okay, and so if you look at how much orange is coming down here versus how much orange is coming down here, more orange action potentials are coming here. So you have you're more sensitive to your position changing. Now instead, if we activate the gamma dynamic fiber, um, we can see that, that this is being stretched. And so, so now during the stretch, more green action potentials are coming down than is happening over here. So you're more sensitive to the speed with which this is ha the stretch is happening. Okay, so why is this happening? Well, when you contract your your muscle, um, the the fibers that are coming down here are called coming from what is called alpha motor neurons, and you produce this contraction. But what happens to the spindle is that it shortens, and so it becomes less sensitive to what's happening within the muscle, okay? There's a shortening, and so there's less activity, could be zero. If instead you have alpha plus this gamma happening at the same time, you maintain the sensitivity of the spindles to sort of unexpected changes that might occur should you, let's say, bump into something that you hadn't expected. Okay, so we've covered the, the, the sensors, the important sensors that we'll talk about today. Now let's look at uh, what, what reflexes they control within the spinal cord itself, um, what the stimulus is that activates them, and what their function of that reflex is. So the first one let's cover is called uh, the monosynaptic stretch reflex. And that's the one that's coming from this 1A afferent that we saw was sensitive to both the speed and the velocity because it's got it getting a signal from both the bag and the chain. The bag provides the velocity sensitivity and the chain provides the position sensitivity. So here we can see that when the length increases, there's firing activity coming from the spindle, and it activates this motor neuron. That in turn contracts the muscle, and then it returns the muscle to its former length. So this reflex helps counteract any stretches that might occur, any change of length. So whenever um, muscle length lengthens, this reflex causes a decrease in the muscle length. And because this, this reflex is monosynaptic, there's just one synapse here in the spinal cord to drive this reflex, it, and because these 1A fibers are the thickest of all your fibers, this reflex is very fast. And if you, so if you bump into something, it quickly reacts, or something bumps into you, um, you quickly react to that. Now, if, in contrast, for some reason, this motor neuron is too active, it'll cause this muscle to become too active, and it'll get activity from this Golgi tendon organ, which will go to the spinal cord. But this time it goes through another neuron, which is indicated here in blue, which provides an inhibitory influence on this um, motor neuron. So let's just replay what happens when this inhibitory effect appears. So now it's, it's firing too much. The Golgi tendon gore gets activated. That activates the inhibitor neuron, and it decreases the activity of the motor neuron. So this reflex is trying to control the force. Okay. Um, you can imagine that for some reason, uh, well, not for some reason. Let's suppose you're holding 
a hop, a cup of hot coffee. And you're, it's a paper cup, one, of the, one from Starbucks. And it's really important to hold it with just the right amount of force, not too much and not too little. Because if it's too much, it'll crush the cup. If it's too little, the cup will drop. So being able to control exactly how much force is being exerted is an important thing. The last thing I want to talk about is another reflex that's uh, more complicated. Okay, so let's suppose you're here. Your foot is on a tack. Okay, so let's say you're walking and your foot steps onto a tack. Okay, so your this foot is extended. The other foot is flexed. When this reflex occurs, you end up in the opposite position. The opposite foot, foot gets extended. This foot gets flexed. Okay. And that, what that allows you is to remain standing. Okay. If you were to lift up, of course, both feet, that would be disastrous. But you, so the foot that steps on the tack removes it its weight-bearing uh, activity, but it, this reflex transfers it to the opposite leg uh, to allow it to take the weight. Now to do this, so you've activated pain receptors in the foot, they go through the spinal cord, and they go through several uh, neurons to activate the muscles that cause the leg to flex. At the same time, they cross over to the opposite side and again go through several neurons to cause this foot, to the muscles, to extend. Okay, so this is called, called reflexes that are mediated by pain and cutaneous afferents on, your, on the sole of your foot. Okay. Now we talked a little bit about tremor, and um, um, no, we didn't talk about. We talked a little bit about uh, gamma drive, and gamma drive, uh, you know, causes the sensitivity uh, of your spindles to increase. It's a volume control. Question might be, why don't you have the volume control up all the time? You just set it up at a high sensitivity. Well, the problem with a high sensitivity is the following. Okay, so we talked about this reflex. Okay, well, for, you get a stretch that activates this reflex. Okay, that then stretches this this muscle, which then causes a, causes a, causes a reflex to the the opposite muscle. Let's follow it again got a reflex, get a contraction, that causes this muscle to stretch, that activates this muscle, and that muscle contracts. So you've got this, when, the, when that muscle contracts, the opposite muscle contracts, that movement stops. Okay, so we start the stretch, the opposite muscle contracts and stops the stretch. Okay, so the, the, the amount of activity here is important because it doesn't um, uh, do anything other than stop the, the hand in the position that's supposed to be in. Now, what happens if you have too much gamma drive? Well, if you have too much gamma drive, whoops, here, too much gamma drive, you can see that here, there's too much activity in this muscle that gets stretched. Okay, that causes this muscle to overshoot. You know, not only stop the movement, but start going in the opposite direction. And that, when it's going in the opposite direction, it starts stretching this muscle again, and that sort of just repeats the process. So it, the, the the limb goes back and forth, and that's called tremor. Um, you might notice that sometimes when you when you're doing some some fine stuff, um, you're trying to thread a needle, your hand might shake. Okay. 
And that's because you've put your gamma drive up too high. Uh, the same thing might happen. Uh, it, in my case, I get tremor in my legs because the, the motor neurons in my legs have uh, too much um, drive. So I've got these, this high sensitivity, not because um, um, the, too much gamma drive, but because these motor neurons have decided to increase their sensitivity. So even bit, a little bit of spindle feedback causes them to overact. Now, in addition to this reflex here through the spinal cord, there's also a reflex up to the, the motor cortex. So it go, goes along that, um, the same pathway as your touch system went and it goes to, instead of area 3B, it goes to area 3A and then it crosses over to the motor cortex, which is just in front of it, and comes back down again and contracts the muscle. So when you, do, when you perform a stretch, you don't get one response in the, in the muscle, but two responses, one coming around the spinal cord and one going up and then coming back down again. Then the advantage of having this reflex is that it can be tuned. Uh, so the cerebellum, which is another structure underneath the brain, uh, and that's important, we, we will see in um, tuning reflexes. Reflexes like those reflexes that allow you to catch a ball properly. And tuning those reflexes alters how much sensitivity this connection has, and so how much drive will come back to it for particular situations. So if you expect a big heavy ball to, to be heading towards you, you'll react differently from, from when it's just a little ping pong ball. So, first of all, uh, close your eyes, okay? and uh, I'm going to pull your hand, and you match it with the other hand. do the vibration as well. Yeah, you can see that they're different. Okay. Good. Open your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> she got. Uh, what we saw there was this sort of position. The 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 the, the tendon I was vibrating um, was in in a the angle was smaller than the tendon that I was not vibrating. Now the signal here wasn't coming from the tendon. Okay, uh, it was coming from the spindle. That spindle is very sensitive to vibration, that 1A spindle uh, that's measuring both position and velocity. And so over here, there was more signal coming from this than from its counterpart. And as a result, she thought this arm was stretched more than it really was. And so she indicated that by moving her elbow out further on the opposite arm. Now, another complication is um, if you contract your muscle and let's say hold, you can, I can hold my arm relaxed or I can hold my arm contracted, okay? When I do that, I still sense my arm in the same position. Without looking, I can sense that it has, hasn't moved. But the amount of alpha 
And gamma is quite different. And I've increased the sensitivity of all those spindle afferents when I, can, when I do this alpha-gamma coactivation. How do I do that? Well, again, we have this quality discharge that's serving a function. Okay, so here we have alpha and gamma coming down to the spindle and then activating the spindle, coming back to the brain, but the signal coming back to the brain isn't, the, the cerebral cortex, isn't um, just the spindle activity, but it's the spindle activity taking into account how much alpha-gamma drive you have. So, in the case when your muscles relax, there's very little coming down, there's very little coming up, and the subtraction gives you a certain sense of position. If, on contrast, you've got a lot, you've got a lot coming down, a lot coming back from the spindle, but it gets compared to a lot from your quality discharge, and the two are subtracted out, and you get the same drive coming back up to the cortex. So this signal is the same as this signal, and you therefore you sense the same position. Now again, um, if you were to try rather than touching your nose, making it a little bit harder and closing your eyes and touching your two fingers together, I just missed there. <laughs> but with a little bit of practice, I can get it. Okay, or at least get it pretty close. Now, why is this such a complicated problem? Okay, well, um, first of all, where, where does the signal go? Okay, it goes up, we said, to this area called 3A. So this was where your somatosensory, the things from the skin surface go. This is the one that tells you, uh, for example, what the angle of your elbow is. So from the, that's determined by the angle, how much activity is being direct coming from this uh, biceps muscle. And similarly, um, the activity from to tell you that your fingers flexed or extended is coming from the muscles that are being activated to move your finger. Now what the brain has to do to be able to tell where your finger is relative to you and where the opposite finger is relative to you is take all these angles into account, okay? So it's not just the one angle that's important, but it's all these angles important. Not only that, it's the length of these arms that are important too, because if these are short arms, they'll be a different position than if they're long. Now, all that occurs back here in the interparietal sulcus. Remember that, that, that was an area that um, we had um, the parietal eye fields and we had all kinds of arm fields. Uh, well, that whole si the, these signals come from, first of all, area 3A and in part area 3B and all go to this thing. And this is part of your dorsal stream, um, which gives you your, the sense of where your limbs are relative to your, the rest of your body. Your egocentric finger position. Now this is a, a nested thing. So um, if you just move your elbow, your shoulder, it moves all these other arm limbs. If you move just your finger, it doesn't move your elbow, a shoulder angle. So um, it's like moving, um, you, put again, you put an apple on a table, and when you move the table, the apple moves as well. So here if I move the shoulder, the finger moves as well. Now again, we have these two streams the egocentric wear stream going back here to the IPS, 
and providing you with proprioception and a kinesthesia. Um, and it goes to areas that we covered in chapter 6 or lecture 6. And then there's another stream that comes from primarily from the, the, the afferents on your skin surface from area 3B and goes to something called S2, which is a, your secondary somatosensory area. So located here, again in the parietal lobe, the lateral parietal lobe rather than interparietal. And that then flows to, uh, again, the temporal cortex um, and various other areas like the um, insular cortex. And here is the, the, the pathway by which you identify what it is you're feeling, whether it's a coin or a shell or a statue of some kind. And that's it. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week for the auditory system.